news starts right now. One of the questions tonight, where is it? Just days before its big reveal at Luminaria, one of the most prominent art festivals in South Texas, this entire art, art sculpture was stolen. All of this art was in a U-Haul trailer and stolen out overnight from outside the Lone Star Arts District. That's near the corner of South Flores and Lone Star Boulevard. Alicia Barrera visited the art studio, spoke to the artists who were still in shock it's gone and are afraid they won't recover all this hard work. This is the breath of the serpent. So it's an all skeleton structure, basically made of metal. A sculpture made by four San Antonio artists. Woodworkers, welders, uh, art, conceptual artists, and, and technical art. A year of hard work for Luminaria, stolen overnight. It's something that they've taken, uh, deprived the city of. Uh, an opportunity to be able to witness this art and be involved in it and be a part of it. The victim was asleep when the suspect crawled through the window that was already cracked open, got inside and didn't walk far to grab the keys from the key holder. The sculpture was broken down into 50 panels of wood and numerous metal rods. It was then placed in this U-Haul trailer connected to artist Timofey Trofimenkov's Black Nissan Frontier. They have no clue what all these individual pieces mean, what it just looks like stack of wood and metal. But to us, it's, it's, it's months and months of work, of labor. The worst fears for sure would be somebody can scrap it for metal. And so you get a better of idea of how this all played out. That truck and trailer was parked on this side of the sidewalk. Right across the street is that art studio, the home of the artist. And it was through that window that you see there closest to the door that the suspect crawled through. And now organizers for Luminaria are pleading to the public for help. So if you see any scraps of metal or scraps of wood, these could be part of that art sculpture. So they're asking you to keep an eye out for that. We also reached out to SAPD. They say they are investigating However, they haven't identified a person of interest. So what's next for these artists? Well, really, they're hoping for a miracle. They know that they wouldn't be able to present at a large scale like they did have planned for Saturday's event. However, they still do want to be present and give something back to the community. That Luminaria event is set to start Saturday at 6 p.m. Reporting live, Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Let's hope they get their hard work back. Thanks, Alicia. San Antonio police have found the answer to at least one question they had regarding a weekend murder on the west side. They've identified the victim as 27-year-old Daniel Flores. Someone shot him last night on Jesse Avenue near Southwest 36th Street. As Katrina Weber reports, neighbors and police still wondering why. In the middle of this west side street, San Antonio police say someone brought an end to 27-year-old Daniel Flores' life. They found him in the 300 block of Jesse Avenue, dead from gunshot wounds around 6 last night after getting calls from neighbors. Yeah, I was at the house on the next block over and I heard some shooting down here. I thought it was that way. William Hall was even more surprised by what he saw next. Officers flooding into the area and roping off the crime scene. Only later did he find out about Flores' murder. Even after the commotion died down, Hall says he still couldn't get the image out of his mind. This morning I come to paint this gate and I found out there's some blood right there. He says he was not able to offer any information about the shooting itself. And police say he's not alone that none of the other neighbors knew what led up to it either. While it seems no one here knows why this happened, it's clear that someone did know this victim. They left a candle here in his memory. For a short time right after the shooting, police thought they had a lead on Flores' killer, but they say their search for that person turned up nothing. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Reaction to the U.S.-Mexico border reopening to non-essential travelers comes down to one word, really. Finally, finally, after 18 months, the back and forth rhythm of life along the border can resume for the most part with proof of vaccination, of course. And as Jesse DeGriado tells us, the next stop for a lot of these Mexican nationals will be San Antonio. 
Many of those non-essential travelers, now able to enter the U.S. with proof of vaccination, have family and friends on San Antonio's south side. This is an opportunity for them just to get out, enjoy life, enjoy it in San Antonio, and do some good shopping. That's exactly what the owner of a south side pizza parlor has been wanting. Before her local customers started coming back, Oralia Delgado says during the pandemic, it was really touch and go for a while. So, you know, it was kind of sad. But now that the border has reopened, she says, the outlook should should be much brighter. With more people coming through and help us uh, regain what we've lost. Her pizza place is among a wide variety of shops at Pica Pica Plaza, an indoor retail center. The manager says many of the shop owners here have ties to Mexico, so reopening the border, she says, will help strengthen those ties. A lot of our shop owners um, travel to Mexico for the merchandise or the product um, that comes in and out back and forth. But she says a lot of merchandise would be stuck at the border or they couldn't cross it themselves. So it did affect a lot of the shops here and the prices too. <laughs> but that was then. Tomorrow they say when Pica Pica opens, promises to be a new day for Mexican shoppers. On the south side, Jesse de Goyado, KSAT 12 News. Rapper Travis Scott says that he will pay all the funeral costs for the eight victims killed Friday in that crowd surge during his Astroworld Festival in Houston. He will also work with the online therapy portal BetterHelp to provide free mental health services to those affected by what happened. Investigators expected to look at the safety barrier designs and crowd control measures to figure out what led to that deadly crush of people. Hundreds of people hurt. 13 are still in the hospital. According to a statement, Scott is talking with Houston law enforcement and city officials there to connect with the victim's families. Parents back here at home are reevaluating safety measures before letting their kids go to a similar event. They tell us they're concerned about the capacity of the event and what security measures were taken. I start seeing pictures and videos of the crowd and I mean, right there, I was concerned. It's, it's just sad, you know, it's really sad that, you know, these kids go to have a good time and they don't expect that. And everybody return, we, you know, expects to return home. Here are some things to keep in mind. If you're ever in a huge crowd, keep your eyes open for an escape, a way out. Leave while you can if you notice the crowd is getting too big. And if it's too late to get out, try to remain upright if the crowd starts pushing. Try to control your breathing and try not to panic. In November, Diabetes Awareness Month, and while our area has high numbers of type 1 and type 2, did you know there are other forms of diabetes? Type 1 often diagnosed in children who are left dealing with a lifetime of insulin injections. Meanwhile, adults are diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and are treated with medications and injections. But Ursula Perry shows us how thousands of people don't fall in either of those two categories, and the search is on for new treatments just for them. 16-year-old Raquel Gabble doesn't let anything slow her down, doing all this while losing her eyesight. Yeah, I can tell there's a wall there, but if I was just sitting here and didn't know anyone was in the room, I wouldn't be able to tell you guys or tell you were, you're sitting there. Diagnosed as a five-year-old with Wolfram syndrome, Raquel, with her mom by her side, has joined clinical trial after clinical trial, all in hopes of finding a way to stop this disease. As a parent, you're sitting there going, what do, you, what do you do with your child who can't see and can't hear? Wolfram syndrome is often misdiagnosed as type 1 diabetes in children. Children experience the same blood sugar problems, but unlike type 1 diabetes... Most cases are caused by a change in the single gene. Now there's a new nationwide clinical trial, Radiant, which is enrolling thousands of people who fall on the diabetes spectrum. Researchers hope to build a comprehensive database of genetic and clinical data, allowing doctors across the world to more easily identify atypical forms of diabetes and identify new genes associated with the rare forms of the disease. We may be able to design a personalized treatment for each patient with diabetes. The ultimate goal, improve and save lives of people like Raquel, living with an unusual form of diabetes. I true, I believe it was soon that I'll be able to see again. There'll be a cure. Sadly, most patients die by the age of 40 if their condition is not managed very well throughout their lives. 
and there's no cure, just medications to treat the symptoms. That's why these clinical trials are so important. And if you'd like to participate in one, we have one in Texas at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Happening tomorrow night at 7, we're going to talk redistricting, what it is and its implications. It's a complicated process used to determine the political landscape of our state and others. And lately, it's been subject to lawsuits by civil rights groups. Stephanie Jimenez and I will host Out of Bounds, repercussions from redistricting. We're going to talk to experts about what redistricting means for our area, what it's historically meant, and we'll be live streaming tomorrow at 7 right after the 6 o'clock news. If you can watch it live, do so on KSAT.com or our KSAT streaming apps. Always questions about that topic every time it comes around. There was a case that explains about it. That's right. It's, there's a lot to explain there. Yeah. All right, let's look outside. This is the first time we get that look, and it's dark at 609. Oh, it's an adjustment, <laughs> isn't it? It's a big adjustment. Yeah, sunset's a little closer to 540 p.m. now, and we had some high, thin clouds give us somewhat of a colorful sunset this evening. Not the time lapse in a bit. 68 right now, it's comfortable outside. Dew point of 56, so not overly muggy, but there is a little extra humidity back in the air compared to previous days, and that led to the morning fog earlier today, and I think another round the next couple of mornings. 73 now in Devon, we're 74 Seguin, 64 Bernie area, Comfort 68, and right now 72 Port SA, Hondo 73. So quiet this evening, uh, temperatures for the most part just falling through the 60s, and we'll have those high clouds turn into some low fog by early tomorrow morning. More on our next cold front coming right up. Good evening, I'm Stephanie Jimenez and coming up tonight on the Night Beat, we're going to continue our coverage on that concert that turned into absolute chaos. The crowd surge at Astroworld killed eight people. Dozens of others were injured and now they're facing issues of their own. Tonight we're going to speak with one woman from San Antonio who was right there as that chaos unfolded. She's going to talk about the trauma she's facing and why mental health experts say that it is important to act right now. Plus, a local fire chief is walking us through the day that heavy rain swept up two cars. There are still plenty of markers nearly a month after the tragedy in St. Hedwig. The tense response to rescue people trapped in trees and high water. We're going to have those stories and so much more when we see you tonight on the Night Beat. Stephen Myra. All right. Thank you, Stephanie. Yep. Proposals are due in a few weeks for a potential transportation system between the San Antonio International Airport and downtown. Reports say that Elon Musk interested in building a tunnel loop. Here. I'm intrigued. Tunnel loop. Yeah. Tell me more. What is this tunnel loop you speak of and can it work here? Our Samuel King joins us now to explain. Sam. Well, Steve and Myra will get to that in a moment. Of course, Elon Musk is building up major operations in Texas, especially up in Austin, including the upcoming move of Tesla's headquarters and hiring for his tunnel company. Musk promises that his tunnels can provide transportation at a lower cost than traditional methods. And he's been putting that to the test out in yeah. Las Vegas. Deep below the Las Vegas Convention Center lies what some call the future of transportation. The Las Vegas Convention Center loop is small, 1.7 miles with three stations. The boring company owned by Elon Musk began construction in November 2019 and the loop opened earlier this year. Last month, county officials signed off on a major expansion of the loop, which will include the Las Vegas Strip. The fact that we're the only place in the world that has this uh, is going to be uh, a lot of interest. And that interest extends here to San Antonio. And while officials can't say too much about it just yet, this document from the Alamo Regional Mobility Authority reads awfully like it's tailored for a Hyperloop or tunnels project between downtown and the airport. By going out to the private sector, it, it opens up the opportunities for what might be possible. Greg Griffin is an assistant planner and program leader for urban and regional planning at UTSA. He says there's a lot of questions about the plans, including the costs and potential environmental concerns that differ from Las Vegas. So, for instance, you know, we've got environmental features. We've got the Edwards Aquifer. Uh, to think about. VIA president and CEO Jeff Arndt is keeping an eye on the potential of the technology and is prepared to partner with whomever brings such a project to our region. Hyperloop technology is essentially and most effectively deployed when you're traveling over relatively long distance, right? A hyperloop between here and Austin with maybe a stop in New Braunfels and San Marcos, let's just say, for example, that's the kind of project that could make sense. 
In Las Vegas, the Boring Company carried the cost for the construction of that initial loop, about $50 million. Right now, of course, achieving the promise of fully autonomous high-speed vehicles is a few years away, maybe even more than that, actually. The Teslas in the Vegas loop have drivers. Now, the proposals are due to the Alamo RMA by December 1st. The finalist is expected to be announced in February. Officials cannot comment, of course, until those bids are submitted. Taking a look at traffic this evening, wouldn't you like a tunnel to get out of this? This is 1604 at Hausman on the northwest side. Slow traffic there on 1604. They're going to have these lane closures alternating between I-10 and Bandera Road beginning at 9. You're also already seeing some backups there. Westbound 16 minutes between I-10 and Bandera Road. Also now have a crash reported here adding to the situation. This is Loop 1604 at Vance Jackson causing in that slowdown you see there. Uh, looking at other parts of the area, including here on the west side, we're going to have some more construction this evening on Loop 410. The southbound frontage road will be closed from Marbach to US 90 here at the top of the hour, and the eastbound ramp will be to I 90 will be closed. US 90 will be closed too for some utility work over the next few days. And we'll have more coming up in the next half hour, guys. All right, thank you, Samuel. Look outside with Sky 12. Look yes, at that. Yes, it is. 617. It, and look at the look at the colors on the dome right it, there. Yeah, yeah. UTSA colors. Orange and blue. It just in general in, inadvertently looks Christmassy out there. Yeah, it does. <laughs> With the mixture it definitely of colors. does. The red and the yeah, green. Yeah. That's yeah. True. And even some of the blue Hanukkah lights missed it, mixed in as well. There, you know? there you go. Oh, Perfect. I like that. I, there's something good about the sun setting so <laughs> early, I guess. It's hard to get used to, but we're there now, yeah. and it's here. It sets at 5.42 p.m. And our mornings, our morning temperatures are going to be on the upswing a little bit compared to what we've had lately, especially over the weekend when we were in the 40s. And look what's going to happen. Tomorrow, upper 50s. Wednesday, lower 60s for morning temperatures. So we don't have that chill in the air again until we get to the end of this week and the upcoming weekend. Friday, we'll start the day near 50. This weekend, we'll have those crisp mornings back in the 40s. All right, take a look at our sunset this evening. It's nice to be able to bring you this time lapse, especially when we have the high thin clouds. And this was a it was a decent sunset. It was nice to have those high clouds overhead, but it wasn't a spectacular light show this time around. We started the day at 49, topped out at 78, and that 78 is four degrees above average for this time of year. We did make it into the 80s south of town, even Hondo at 81, along with Del Rio, but 83 the high in Pleasanton and 85 was the high in Catula. And I do anticipate temperatures to be near 80 for highs the next couple of days. Here's another nice shot with the sun setting off in the background. 68 right now at the airport. Dew point of 56, so it's not necessarily muggy. You don't notice the humidity all that much, but these dew point numbers are higher than what we had over the weekend. So there is added moisture in the air, and it's the time of year where we have longer nights. In turn, more opportunity and more time to generate fog. So it's the time of year where we often see fog, and at the very least, a thick dew on the grass. That's going to be the case late tonight and early tomorrow morning. Those dew points in the 50s to right near 60 degrees. And it's not going to be all that muggy in the foreseeable future, but Tuesday, Wednesday, we'll have those dew points right around 60, so a hint of humidity in the air. Then a cold front sweeps away that mugginess for Thursday and Friday, only to see it resurge back into a place just a little bit over the weekend. But again, no oppressive humidity and not the kind of humidity I anticipate anybody to really complain about. Right now we're 70 degrees south of Highway 90, generally in the 60s north of Highway 90. New Braunfels 68, 73 Hondo, 73 in Pleasanton. Let's talk about tomorrow morning though. This is what we're expecting on the map, not as chilly. Canyon Lake 57, along with Uvalde, Carrizo Springs 59. Gonzales 57, you get to Timberwood Park 57, Burning 55, and Elmendor 59. By the afternoon, we'll have more clouds than sunshine, but I think we'll still get those temperatures boosted upper 70s to right near 80 degrees. By tomorrow, usually around 3 4 o'clock, we hit that high temperature. And high temperatures will take a little bit of a dip by Thursday, Veterans Day. We're talking near 70, so that's our first cold front hits Wednesday night. It'll drop our temperatures a little bit for Thursday. And then you see little ups and downs as we go through the weekend. Bottom line here from tomorrow all the way through the weekend, high temperatures will range from 70 to near 80 degrees. So no huge temperature swing. It's just the cooler mornings this weekend on the way. Pacific moisture coming in aloft in our atmosphere. That's at about 30,000 feet high. It's giving us those thin clouds moving overhead. 
Big Blue H still influencing our weather. It was in control all weekend. That's why we had that sunshine. Wall to wall sunshine over the weekend. Our next disturbance moving into the Pacific Northwest. That's going to swing a cold front through Wednesday night. Don't anticipate much, if any, rain with it. So tomorrow, a little more cloud cover than sunshine. Some patchy fog in the morning, starting at 51, then making it to or 57, I should say, then making it to 78. We do it all over again on Wednesday. Wednesday night, a 10% chance of showers. And then Veterans Day on Thursday, sunny but breezy and pleasant near 70 with low humidity. That looks like a beautiful week. Thank you, Adam. You know, I've been saying it every week. You yes. can't spell undefeated <laughs> without UTSA. One more time. One more time, Greg. <laughs> well, and will they get the respect from the college football playoff committee? They don't seem to be getting from the college football polls right yeah. now because they only moved up to, what, number 15, and they're one of only four undefeated teams left in the FBS. And who's the starting quarterback now at UT? Coming up. Ranked UTSA Roadrunners are now one of only four undefeated college football teams at the FBS level, and they are in some great company. Number one, Georgia. Number two, Cincinnati. Number four, Oklahoma. And of course, UTSA all stand at 9 0. That comes after the Roadrunners roughed up UTEP in El Paso late Saturday night, and KSAT 12 Sports was there. Sincere McCormick, as you see right here, was a beast in the 44 23 victory. The former Judson Rocket rushed for 169 yards, including that 75 yard touchdown to get the night off on the right foot. Right behind him was Frank Harris, who was responsible for four touchdowns. Two on the ground, two in the air to finish with 286 yards passing, another 76 yards on the ground. Now two of their last three games will be at home, and head coach Jeff Trailer wants his team to stay focused. We went over it like what makes cultures decline? Prosperity does. We got a lot of prosperity right now. Pressure does. We don't feel pressure. Our kids don't feel pressure. And what was my third P? So preoccupied with getting attention, you, you, you get in your own way because you want so much attention, you're not paying attention. That's what makes cultures decline. You study history books forever. Like how do we handle those three Ps? That's what we got to work on every day. We got to continue to show ourselves. Uh, we're not USTA, we're United States Tennis Association, or whatever. Uh, we're UTSA, and we're here to you know showcase our talent. We're a great program, and we have a lot to still prove. All right, respect. The Roadrunners will have a chance to go 10 and 0 when they host one and a Southern Miss 2:30 in the Alamo Dome. Texas Longhorns have now lost four in a row and stand four and five overall, just two and four in the Big 12. They'll have a chance to break out of that losing streak this weekend when they host one and eight Kansas and Austin. This is the first four game losing streak since 2010, and it came after head coach Steve Sarkeesian pulled his starting quarterback Casey Thompson after going two for six for just two yards in the 30 to seven loss to Iowa State on the road. Once again, the Horns had the lead at halftime seven to three, but they were outscored 27 to nothing in the second half. So who is the Longhorns starting quarterback now? Obviously, we made the move in game. Uh, we need to evaluate that this week, uh, and there's an, plenty of things to evaluate. You know, we got to assess Casey's thumb uh, to see where that's at. I think that did have a bit of an impact on him in the ball game. Um, and we got to assess the just kind of how it flows this week uh, throughout the week. So, you know, we'll we'll address that later in the week. I'll have an answer for you guys. I guess it would be Thursday of what we're going to do there. All right, Texas is in favor by 29 and a half points when they host Kansas at Royal Memorial Stadium Saturday night at 630. Meantime, the fight in Texas Aggies continue their rebound in the SEC by dominating 12th ranked Auburn Tigers at Kyle Field with their outstanding defense. As a result, the Aggies improve to 7 2, move up to number 11 in the latest college football poll after winning their fourth game in a row. In fact, the only touchdown in the 20 3 victory over the Tigers came in the fourth quarter from the Aggie defense. When Bo Nix tried to avoid the rush, he drops a football. Michael Clemens is able to scoop it up and score a 24 yard touchdown. And the Aggie crowd of 109,835, the second largest in the history of Kyle Field goes nuts. What does it say about this team to pull out a win without a single touchdown from the offense? San Antonio's own DeMarvin Leal has the answer. I would say that, you know, this is what the game is supposed to be like. You know, sometimes offense has the defensive back, the defense has the offensive back. This just shows that we're here to play as a team. And we came out and we did exactly what we were supposed to do. All right, the Aggies are not to face number 12 Ole Miss on the road, who is 7-2 and two overall, but 5-0 and oh at home. The Aggies are two and a half point favors. Kickoff is at 6 p.m. That will be their toughest test here. They have three games left like everybody else. Yep. All right. Thanks, Greg. Got it. Our KSAT Q&A is up next.
a hate group protesting outside the Jewish Community Center. Flyers distributed in a San Antonio neighborhood and a hateful message written on the side of a local business. These are all incidents that we've seen in the last couple of weeks in San Antonio. So let's discuss this with the Southwest Regional Director of the Anti-Defamation League, Mark Tobin. Mark, I appreciate you being with us. We've had you on before. Are we seeing, I mean, obviously we're seeing an increase in these incidents that at least we're taking note of in San Antonio. Are you seeing it across the country or even in the state of Texas? Yeah, first, thank you for having me back. Um, I'm glad uh, to have the opportunity to speak with y'all. Um, yes, unfortunately, this is not a trend strictly affecting San Antonio or Texas, but something that's happening at various parts around the country. Uh, there are certain extremist groups um, who connect uh, online through various social media platforms, um, and they may organize a trip like happened recently, really for the purpose of recruitment to gain attention and, quite frankly, to gain funds. And the fact that you mentioned these groups, that there is some kind of organization, at least it seems, with some of these rallies, some of these hateful events moving from state to state. Is that unique or is that something that the ADL has known about for quite some time and, and been tracking? And we've been tracking it for the for the last few years. And certainly there's there's been an increase in groups, you know, connecting Charlottesville, for example. Uh, that was a prime example of how uh, extremists connected and planned uh, the rally uh, for, for Charlottesville back in September of 17. So it's it's newer, but it's not new. Talk about um, how you track these things. Not only do you track these things, I mean, I, sometimes you're able to infiltrate some of these groups. Am I right? Well, we don't we don't uh, infiltrate. No. OK. Um, everything that that we do, we come by from public sourcing. Um, we have some very dedicated people that uh, that keep track of these things. But um, in, in this case, this is a group which wanted to publicize their activities in order to recruit new members and, quite frankly, to raise money. Uh, so uh, anybody that was paying attention you know, could, could watch, which is a problem. You know, Steve mentioned some of the things that we have seen in San Antonio just in the last couple of weeks with, you know, sandwich bags full of flyers being tossed into people's driveways throughout a neighborhood, large signs on the side of a business, all of that within the last month or so. So is there a reason why some of these anti-Semitic actions, these events, messages are being spread right now? Um you know, it's it's hard to really know for for sure unless you can actually talk to each person uh, who might be perpetrating these these forms of hatred. Um, secondly, uh, while anti-Semitism is a big part of it, uh, this is all about spreading hate. It's all about creating divisiveness, um, and it is all about blaming. It's about blaming the other, whether it's a Jewish person or a black person or an immigrant. Uh, these are efforts in order to gain political power by trying to ostracize, dehumanize, and label people that they consider other. Uh, why now? You know, certainly there's, there's an uptick. In 2020, for example, there were over 5,000 instances of distributions of white supremacist propaganda, uh, the highest of all time, and Texas led the country with almost 600 incidences. Uh, so we've been seeing this increase. And, uh, you know, if, if I were to, to, to take some, some guesses, I suppose it would be that um, these groups are, are feeling emboldened. Uh, they're feeling emboldened by the fact that even though uh, the attack on the Capitol on January 6th uh, was, was condemned, there are some, including people uh, in office, who are defending it. Um, just like when they got the green light during Charlottesville about the, you know, there's good people on both sides. Uh, and so they, they see these kinds of, of either inactions or actions um, as uh, opportunities to advance their own cause. Uh, you know, there's a lot of sort of anti-government fervor uh, that might be directed right now at schools or at the federal government. Uh, they also look at this as an opportunity. Uh, in order to push their own agenda and push their own message 
uh, which will further create wedges in our society. Mark, I like how you put that, attacking the other. That's what a lot of these groups, these hate groups, are trying to do, no matter what the other is. If you're trying to stand up to this, if you're trying to do something to counteract what is happening in your community, whether it's San Antonio or anywhere, what's your advice to people? How can uh, people you know, help? There's, sure, and, and that's what's critical. If we are going to change the environment we're in, um, which is an environment which is allowing uh, this kind of hatred to, to grow, um, it's incumbent upon everyone. And there are certain things that can be done at the policy level, uh, whether that's opposing extremists who might want to enter government service, uh, is either the military or law enforcement, um, or ending the complicity of social media and facilitating extremism. Uh, it, there's also the message of delivering to the social media companies about, um, while the capitalist intentions are all great, the idea that uh, profit should be superior to uh, disallowing the kind of hate and denialism and anti-Semitism uh, and racism that is perpetrated on online platforms has to end. Uh, and those are at the policy level. Individually, everyone has uh, a role. And once again, that can start by holding your elected officials accountable, number one. Um, number two, like so many things, um, anti-hatred starts in the home. And it starts by showing and providing examples of how people should be treated uh, and when it's appropriate to, to take a stand and when it's appropriate to say something and when it's appropriate to report an incident. And incident reporting, by the way, is a really important piece. Uh, unfortunately, most people who are uh, victims of hate instances and hate crimes do not report. Uh, and we need to change that. And there's many efforts underway in order to do that. But people need to be, feel comfortable and feel safe so that they can report. And then we have an even better idea of where this kind of activity is happening. And we do have a database, ADL.org uh, report incidents. If anyone sees any kind of hate discrimination, uh, hate crime, uh, please uh, let us know about it and, and we will respond. And part of the effort to stand up to hate is happening right here in San Antonio tomorrow evening. There was a unity event being held on the campus of San Antonio Jewish community. We have all the details on our website at ksat.com. Uh, you have to sign up before you attend, so check that out online. Mark Tobin, thanks so much for being with us from the Anti-Defamation League. We always appreciate the information you share. And I always appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Some construction to tell you about again on Loop 410 on the west side, uh, beginning at 8, uh, main lane closures, some alternate closures between military and Marbach, so watch out for that. We told you this the last half hour. Once you're past Marbach, the frontage road will be closed all the way down to US 90. That actually begins in about 18 minutes or so. Uh, telling you about the change up here in Kendall County, the eastbound ramp to State Highway 46 is now closed, and Bernie has to continue that construction project. Let's take a look at some travel times uh, this evening. Coming in from Bernie looks okay, 27 minutes to downtown. We do have a crash reported at I-10 and the medical center area, medical drive, so that's slowing you down a little bit just before loop 410, but this is I-10 in days of Allah. Once you're past that, things look fine, guys. All right, thanks, thanks you. Live cam tonight. Nice shot of the lights, 69 <laughs> degrees. You know, I'm, we're usually talking about the sunset. Yeah. <laughs> But that's long gone. That's over. It's not happening. Well, it's been down for uh, 61 minutes now. The sun has set. It's that time of year. And it's also the time of year when we get longer nights. You know, we have uh, more nighttime, and that allows us to generate fog. And so I anticipate another morning with some areas of fog. But out there right now, just some high clouds streaming overhead. We're at 68 degrees. We'll drop down into the upper 50s by tomorrow morning. We'll talk about a couple of cold fronts that we have in the forecast coming up. All right, beautiful start to the week out there today. Is that going to continue? 
Oh, it is Myra. It's going to be beautiful this week, but morning temperatures will be on the rise a little bit and before they fall off again, we'll have some bumpy temperatures, but not huge swings. So nothing that you really need to plan around completely just incrementally here and there. So here are our headlines overall a comfortable week despite some bumpy temperatures here and there. Another cold front and actually it looks like two cold fronts are in the forecast, but minimal rain chances with those fronts. Uh, we're not looking at good odds of rainfall. I wish I had better news, but unfortunately rain is looking very limited with these fronts and the sun has set. And so some of this visible satellite imagery, of course, turns dark and turns black when the sun goes down. But I want to point out that we still have those high clouds streaming in from the Pacific and you can see them here, especially over the past couple of hours before the sun sets and those cl high thin clouds will be streaming overhead tomorrow and we'll have some breaks in the clouds. But overall, you'll just notice those high thin clouds and keep in mind if you ever see that kind of ring around the sun during the day, it's because of the way the sunlight refracts and then reflects from those ice crystals in the sky. So sometimes you get one of those halos around the sun, a 22 degree halo is what that's called. So I know we get a lot of questions about those and whenever you have serious clouds, you can have them upper level high over Mexico right now. That's the blue H just south of us. That was influencing our weather all weekend. Now with that clockwise flow around it, it's steering those high clouds overhead. Our next disturbance is moving into the Pacific Northwest right now. Some heavy rainfall into drought stricken Northern California. It's moving on shore. That's good. We like to see rain out West. We've been in drought. We know what it's like and they are there and they still need the relief. So they'll get another round, but that system's going to swing through here Tuesday night whole whopping 10% chance of showers. So don't get your hopes up here anytime soon for any good rainfall or any promising rain. There's our nice sunset this evening. Those high clouds streaming overhead 68 right now. Dew point of 56. So there is some extra humidity in the air. It's just not all that noticeable. Definitely not oppressive, but it's enough to give us a thick dew on the grass and your car if you park outside in the morning and even some areas of fog. So anticipate that again tomorrow morning. Temperatures now 60s near 70, 72 Castroville, 70 in Canyon Lake, 66 Converse and Divine now at 69. Still 76 Catula and Del Rio. So let's talk about tomorrow morning. We're thinking for the most part upper 50s. You get into the hill country, some mid 50s, Kerrville, Fredericksburg, 55. Meanwhile, 57 Hondo and Gonzales and in and around San Antonio, Lake Hills, 57, Timberwood Park as well, Elmendorf, 59 and Bernie, 55. So not as cool tomorrow morning. And by the afternoon, we'll have some breaks in the clouds well into the 70s, just pushing 80 degrees. We'll be flirting with 80. We're talking 79 Von Army and Lavernia, 77 in Stone Oak tomorrow afternoon. A little bit of morning fog giving way to mostly cloudy conditions, but some breaks in those clouds throughout the day tomorrow. And then looking ahead Tuesday or Wednesday night, I should say that's the next cold front Wednesday night, and that gives us the 10% chance of a few showers. Veterans Day Thursday looking at breezy conditions, low humidity, but a lot of sunshine in near 70. And then it looks like another little temperature drop late in the weekend with another cold front. Lovely all week. Thanks, Adam. I like the cold fronts because when I'm growing this beard for no shave November, it kind of fits more. It does. Like if it's 100 degrees, it might be a little, little much. Maybe, maybe a little much now. <laughs> in case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. Monday, it is November 8th. Thank you so much for starting your morning with us. New this morning, San Antonio police are looking for the person responsible for stabbing a man last night. It happened around 9.30 p.m. at the Red Roof Inn on Wolf Road. Officers tell us the man was stabbed in the stomach during an argument in the parking lot. That suspect took off before police got there. And we have new details about a man who died after someone shot him over the weekend. Police say that that man was 27 year old Daniel Flores. According to officers, they found him in the street after someone had shot him several times. Flores pronounced dead at the scene. Neighbors told officers they heard gunshots, but they couldn't provide any more details. So far, police are still searching for the person responsible. 19 year old Jonah Kai Stone facing a charge of intoxication manslaughter tonight. The Department of Public Safety says Stone was speeding on I-10 Thursday night. He swerved to try to avoid hitting another car from behind, but instead hit the car and veered across the center median. 
landing his truck in a ravine. The truck rolled several times. 17-year-old David Palestrant was a passenger in that truck and died at the scene. Investigators say he was not wearing a seatbelt. We're told the driver of a pickup truck made a U-turn, crashed into another vehicle. Police say this caused the truck to roll onto its side. The driver hospitalized. He should be okay. As soon as the countdown started, everyone starts rushing in. Harris says she goes to concerts with her son all the time, and she's used to seeing the young crowd's high energy, which is why she doesn't blame Travis Scott or Drake, who may face lawsuits in the future. <gasps>A uh, few incidents here and there. We had been watching uh, this crash at I-10 uh, in the medical center area, but that seems to have just cleared. So uh, that's a good news there. So still looking fairly good when it comes to coming in from Bernie. Also watching crash here on the north side. This is 16, uh, excuse me, north of 1604 or, or south of 1604, 281 at Nakoma. So watch out for that. All right, Sam, next couple of days comfortable. We'll be in the upper 70s near 80 for highs and mornings a little closer to 60. So not as cool in the mornings and afternoons. Pleasant, not overly humid, just a hint of humidity in the air. 10% chance of showers Wednesday night, then cooler, breezy, near 70 for a high on Veterans Day. Thank you, Adam, and thank you for watching the News at 6. See you back here on the Night Beat at 10.